right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined by Dr. Carol Scott, who is up in Portland, Oregon. How are you doing, Carol? I am doing fabulous today, John. Yeah, and, and Carol is, uh, de- has uh, created the unique self-aware success strategies uh, model. And, uh, and what we're going to talk about today is um, a really interesting subject. And this is a surprising news, and it's a, certainly a surprise to me, and it's probably going to be a surprise to many of you, is that many of the tools that we need could have been picked up before the age of seven, but often were not. So let's get straight into it. I mean, uh, a lot of us think that the tools we need for for being successful in life, particularly as adults, are ones that we develop much later in life or we search out ourselves or you know, we get mentors for or whatever. So let's talk about what could what what was available pre seven. Pre seven is a good uh, area to focus on. You know, we used to think, John, that uh, children didn't need to start education until they were fourteen and. Then we decided they needed to start it when they were, you know, 10. And now we're down to five pretty consistently. But what we really need to understand is that we build our brains from birth to five. So mm-hmm. before kids walk in the door of kindergarten, they have taken a, a, a bundle of 100 billion loose neurons and connected them up in meaningful patterns of understanding and interpretation of the world. And almost all of that happens before age three. And 95% of it is done by age five. So interpersonally, all of the brain wiring around getting along with other people, which is the core of success, no matter what you do, that all happens birth to three. And we literally wire 85% of our brain up around how to get along in life by then. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really interesting because uh, obviously different people have different parenting styles uh, for kids and you know, how they, how they raise kids. So um, is, when you, when later on, is it really you know, for somebody trained like you? Can you see the uh, see how one person was maybe nurtured between zero and five than another person? You know, interestingly, I can. As a developmental psychologist, I look at the whole lifespan of development, but my expertise focus has been on. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Birth to five, um, and so I can. You know, knowing that a person really learns how to identify who they are as a unique being separate from everyone else. That happens when you're around two. Well, if you're really defensive and you don't really know who you are and you're pretty um, uh, uh, kind of responsive and reactive to other people's ideas of who you are, then that tells me something about what your toddlerhood was like, if you will. Right, right. Now that that's that that's fascinating. And so, if you're you're advising um, people, especially parents with young children, or the, what, what's the way to how do you, how do you optimize this, or what's the best thing to do to make sure that your child is is as well equipped as possible? You know, there's sort of two conflicting pieces of advice. One is watch and protect. And two is get out of the way. <laughs> and they're not really conflicting when you look at them in detail. Yeah. Children come with a huge amount of capacity and competence that most adults don't recognize is there. We think of them as these malleable little Play-Doh balls that don't have a lot going on between their ears, and that is absolutely not the case. And so if we can, first of all, just recognize the competence and protect it, make sure they don't get physically harmed, make sure they don't get ill, um, keep them away from people that will be bad for them, then they can do a lot after that without us getting in the way. And we tend to hover and push ourselves into the developmental process way before the child needs us to, frankly, most of the time. We're, we're interfering with something the child could be doing to show us how competent they already are. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it is really fascinating because I remember my son when he was a toddler, when he was a baby or a toddler, and he hadn't started speaking um, yet. Well, he wasn't late speaker. He just hadn't speak, hadn't started speaking yet. And of course, us being first time parents or whatever, I thought, oh, dear. You know, <laughs> so we took him to a you know, speech therapist who kind of looked at us like, are you mad? But one thing she did say is, um, have you thought about teaching him sign language? And we taught him sign language. And he had about uh, at one stage before he started talking, he had about 20 to 25 different signs. He could tell us what shows he wanted to watch on TV. He could tell us all. And, and to your point, 
I mean, we would never have known just the the capacity that was there without us being panicky first time parents. Right, right. And some of some of the things are simple. I watched a little video not too long ago, about three minute clip of a oh a baby of about maybe seven months old, kind of just rolling around in a blanket, and there were a bunch of toys. And she tried to reach and pick up one of the toys, and she couldn't quite get it at first. Her hand wasn't reaching far enough to get a grip on it. And if a, an adult had stepped in and pushed it toward her, she never would have figured it out on her own, but she did. And she gosh, she was like a little primate. She used her leg and her arm and brought it up onto her. It was amazing to watch her do it, but she did it. And we don't find out how much they can do if we do it for them. So yeah. get out of the way and let them roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it, it is, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that is, that is the challenge nowadays because, um, you know, we have maybe all become a little overprotective. I mean, we're maybe a bit, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, maybe they were a little bit more on the reckless side. Maybe there's a happy medium. <laughs> I always yeah. say coming, coming from Ireland, I would say like, well, we all had like, I've five kids in my family. So we all have big families because, you know, in those days, you know, you could lose one or two along the way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Um, but so what's the so um, what's the happy medium here in terms of like creating creating an environment where the, the kids can can go through self discovery, but in a safe environment, or uh, so that they feel like they have the independence to do these things, but not feel neglected at the same time. Oh, that's a that's a really tricky balance, and I think one of the ways to know that is to just jump ahead 20 years. Look at who we really want these people to be when they're grownups. What do you want them to be able to do? And we can look at this sort of recovery work. If we don't feel like we have these assets from before seven ourselves, we can do the same thing. Well, what is it that I'd like to be as an adult that I'm not, you know? But also looking ahead, what, what kind of an adult do you want your, your person to be, your little person? Do you want them to be someone who is compassionate, who understands other people? Do you want them to be someone who is highly successful, who has uh, ambition and focus and sets goals for themselves? These are all things that children develop capacities for before the age of seven. And so knowing what's out there in my mind for that child helps me think about what do I need to be focusing on right now? Yeah, yeah. well, because one, one of the things that somebody told me when when my son was really really small was that they used to set up these um earning boards in their kitchen you know so they would say so if you wanted a new toy or something like that you'd say uh, okay here's a couple of things and they'd visually lay them out on the board and then and we did it for my son it was fantastic and you know and they get to check off or they get to check off you know each step of that process so they learn reward comes from earning at yeah. an early age and yeah. uh, and that, that for me was profound yeah when kids are ready with the the logic structures that come on board about six uh years of age to get cause and effect i mean they start figuring out around four but it takes them until six to really understand oh things happen because things happen <laughs> i do this yeah. that happens and then associations for things like earning potential and how my consequences my rewards meet my effort those become really important lessons in those final couple of years of what we call the early childhood period of birth to eight. Yeah, because one of the things I often say to people uh, and is that you can teach people a lot of things, but some things like hard work, uh, work ethic, I just don't feel you can teach people. I mean, that's either it. And I think and I do think it comes a lot from from formative years. Yeah. In the, I, at the, the seven Success strategies, one of them is called vision at the age of five, the ability to conceive of a goal, a short-term goal, a doable thing that I'm going to actually not just dream about and work on for 30 years, but this is going to happen in the next nine months, 18 months. That sort of vision and then the plan to get there, mapping out the steps, that's something that kids have a natural propensity for. It's like there's an open window of opportunity when you're five Mm -hmm. because you want to figure out how things work. At five, you know, have you ever seen a five-year-old like want to take something apart, a piece of machinery? They're not very good at putting it back together usually, but they love to take stuff apart. That's that same developmental window. I want to understand how things, how you get stuff done. And so I'm going to set a goal. And they spend a lot of time planning what they're going to do. They don't often get it actually done. And that's the place where the adult support comes in. And so if we as adults in our workplace can set the goal and not ever get there, that tells us where the work is. Oh, I need to go back and have a development do-over on five. 
<laughs> yeah yeah so that's what i was going to ask you about so so it's great so if you're if if you have young kids now and uh, you're, you're listening you can check out uh, dr scott's um, work and you can do all this great stuff to prepare them what about for the rest of the people who are now uh you know firmly and maybe like some of us in, in well in their adult years um how can you number one recognize some some of these things that maybe are missing and then what can you do to remediate well, I think sort of the some of the big indicators are failure to rise, <laughs> failure to thrive mm -hmm. in the in whatever it is you're trying to be successful in. So if over and over you've missed an opportunity to take the step up, um, that's an indicator that something's missing. Success in whatever we do requires that we have these assets, requires that we be able to play in, in the adult sandboxes of life and get along with people. And sometimes we don't recognize that we're not getting along with people because it's so it's at a subtle deep level. For example, um, to, I believe that to be successful in my work, I need to trust that my needs are met. If not by <clears throat> individuals in front of me right at the moment, you know, you're not necessarily going to meet a specific need, emotional need or interpersonal need that I have. But if I know that those needs are met, I'm not carrying them into this conversation like baggage. Mm. Okay. If I'm a salesperson and what I want is to turn you into my next, uh, I want to transform you into my next sex figure income client. And what I'm doing is I'm carrying in a need for validation that's not been met in my life, a validation as a, a, a person who's worthy. I'm going to carry that in like a little bag and unpack it in the middle of our meeting at some point, and I am not going to be successful in my goal. Yeah, that I, I, I love that because that's so... Um... Uh, that's so interesting because I, I totally believe this that this part of baggage and how we can under undo us and and triggers because like you said there if you come in and you're not you know you haven't had you haven't been validated in the way you need it or whatever whether that was before or now or whatever your needs aren't being met uh you're carrying that baggage in then something that perhaps you say during the meeting the other person says or a look they give you that's completely innocent or that has no you attach a relevance to it immediately and suddenly yes. you just you just completely everything gets on unwound yeah and that trust success strategy that we get that when we're an infant we learn to let the world meet our needs and to be space feel safe about that when we're six months old and so you weren't even aware of that now, but you need you weren't aware of it then, but you sure need to be aware of it now, how that went and whether it's operating for you now. And then the the other piece of you you actually referred to the, the second success strategy of independence at the same time. Mm -hmm. That sort of knowing who I am and who I'm not uh, keeps me from having those kinds of reactivity, I'm attaching meaning to a glance or a single word or a, you know, it's like I don't have to make that into anything about me if I know who I am. And that's a toddler. That's the little toddler figuring out, this is what I want, this is what I think, this is what I feel, and shut up, because right. I'm right. <laughs> that's your two-year-old. <laughs> yeah, well, I know a few adults like that too. But <laughs> Well, this is my point. This is exactly my point. And you know, John, I said, uh, I said one time to my therapist, I grew up in a family full of trauma. So I have on, on the list of 10 adverse childhood experiences that can really mess with you when you're a kid, I had seven of them. And so I've been doing a lot of, of work and recovery for a long time. And I said to my therapist one time, I feel like, like this preschooler inside of me is running my staff meetings. And her suggestion was, I think on the way to work, you need to imagine dropping her off at childcare. <laughs> oh, that's great. Though. That, it's simple. It was no, a good I, strategy. I, it was a good it strategy. Was. It was, I had to tell my, I had to admit to my dentist a, a while back, you know, I said, I'm sorry, when it comes to going to the dentist, I walk in the door, I said, I feel like a child immediately, because you're going to lecture me, you're going to tell me, and I just get completely, yep. like, go back into, like, feeling like a little kid. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, dentists uh, just do that. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, and those patterns, like, so, so what you're talking about is a, a pattern that was wired into your brain when you were little, and you're just playing it out now, you're just it's just running its its tape for you yeah. yeah and part of why i do these development do-overs is so that people can start to repattern if you repattern your behavior you start to repattern rewire your brain on the other side of it yeah and and it's and it is it, it's fascinating with that uh but that whole part about uh validation and and uh 
and success because I, I, feel, I feel the other thing is that we live in such a world today where, you know, with social media and everything, I mean, everybody's been bombarded with these fake images of everybody else is having a wonderful life and I'm not, <laughs> everybody else is successful and I'm not, you know, the com- I call it the comparison right. culture. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like that exacer- can really exacerbate these problems if you don't address them. I agree completely. And, and it is at that level of the toddlers success strategy of being independent, knowing, you know, what other people think of me and what other people do, not relevant. I got, I got my thing going on over here and I know what it is and I'm cool. That feeling of, I am exactly enough. I'm not too much. I'm not too little. I'm not too big. I'm not too small. I'm not too smart. I'm not too dumb. All of that sense of, I am on target for, you know, I am the person I am here. Mm-hmm. That sense is something we mess with badly in toddlers, I think, in the United States in particular. We're not very good at toddlers. We tend mm-hmm. to think that all of that assertive, I am who I am and you're not me, <laughs> stuff is uh, like something that has to be broken. The will of the child must be broken. They shouldn't be able to be that strong in who they are. Well, but what we want them for, to be when they're adults is you know, strongly independent and capable of running their life and knowing who they are. So uh, it's yeah. just really contradictory to our goals as as parents and teachers sometimes. Yeah, I, I often feel like a lot of people love the idea of having children. They just don't love the reality of it. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> very um, good point. Well, especially when you see the ones who can't wait, you know, after a couple of years, they look so stressed and they can't wait to offload <laughs> them on their knees or daycare right. or here, go to camp. And when to are they going to be 18? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so um, the, the other part that I just wanted to ask you is what, what are some, what are another of the very typical ones that you come across that people should look out for in themselves? Um, you know, I think besides uh, the capacity for trust and independence that come from the infant and toddler, one of the crucial ones is the four-year-old's capacity for negotiation. Mm. These guys are like the little diplomats of the social world. They are all about helping win-win. They want win-win solutions. They want you to get what you want, and they want to get what they want. And they're brilliant at figuring it out. And they'll they'll stand and work with another kid to negotiate a place where both are happy for a long time at four. And um, that is something that we aren't very good at either as adults, a lot of us. And I've seen it getting worse, it seems like over the past couple of years. It's like, it's, it's not okay to want it. It's not okay to even say that I want something. And then if you don't want me to have it, it's a fight immediately. I can't like make a case or be calm or just say, well, if you can't help me out, I'll go get it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, fun, it's funny you mention that because we're actually going through um, a little bit of rebranding right now and our, our new thing is all around win together. And we believe that uh, in, sale, in sales, you should win together. Like you know, the customer should win, you should win. And the internal teammate should win, partners, everybody should win together. And to your point, I think we've gotten away from that because we've gotten into this whole thing of, and I think it's also about your outlook on life whether you have an abundant mentality or not, because otherwise you think if <clears throat> if if I have to give up a little bit, that means you got something, you got more, or I don't, there's not enough for all of us, you know, so we can't win together when the point is, yes, we can. Yeah. And when we don't know how to negotiate to get what we want, our choices are to become a bully or to become mm-hmm. someone who is bullied by others and never get what we want. And yeah. those two extremes, it's a continuum, but those two extremes is what a lot of us have wound up with now. We aren't getting what we want. And we're not letting anybody else have what they want either. And it's just not a solution for going forward in the world, in my opinion. Yeah. And one other interesting thing is uh, there was a company I ran um, some years back, a consulting company. But one of the things when we talked about um, negotiations, actually interesting, is that we used to use the, uh, the, the example of a child, because if you look at a kid, right, if the kid says, there's a new ride at the theme park and I want to go on it, right? And you can argue with them, but they will always just fixate on the new ride at the park and they won't dilute their argument. As adults, we'll start to bring in extraneous arguments to try and support it uh, in this because we've been taught that this is the way to do it. Bring in more and more supporting, but you're actually diluting your argument. Your kids are the best because they stay laser focused on the goal. And what I've seen four year olds do that I just love is it's like they see that what the adult wants is somewhere in here. And they're shooting their target. They're like shooting their ideas, trying to hit inside what's okay with the grown-up. Like, you want me to pick whether I want this or that for lunch, but I don't really want either one of them. But what could I ask for that would still be inside your container? 
yeah. wouldn't go outside your boundaries of what's for lunch. And they're, they get really good at it if you negotiate with them, if you allow them to say, yeah. I don't want either of the choices you're offering me. I want this other thing. And if it really is okay with you and there's no reason to say no, say yes. <laughs> get out of their uh, yeah. way. Get out of their way. Let them negotiate their way to a different deal. <laughs> Exactly. But exactly. And to your point, as adults, unfortunately, uh, nego negotiation is one of those things that gets a lot, of, even the best salespeople, sometimes it gets them very tense and very nervous. Mm -hmm. And the person they're negotiating feels the same. And there's all this tension around something that if we reoriented our attitude towards and say, OK, we're looking for an outcome here where we all win. Uh, and as uh, and as the founder of our company always says, you know, some a good deal is when it hurts everybody a little bit. Okay, everybody had to give up. Everybody didn't get exactly what they wanted, but they got enough of it to feel happy. And that I call the six-year-old success strategy of compromise. Because mm -hmm. in negotiation, you really both get what you want. Because it's simple. I want this. You want that. Boom. Yeah. In compromise, we have to recognize that I want five things. You want five things. That I know I'm going to happen. And yeah. so everybody has to give a little for us to have a community that works for everyone, a solution that works for everyone. Yeah, and I think that's a very profound point to just underline there, that it, it, uh, for the community to work, for everything to work, it has to work for everybody, and it can't just work for you. And and that's it. And if you if you approach everything from a point of view of, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's binary, it's win or lose, well, well, you're going to have a very happy life, to be honest. Exactly. I like <laughs> a happy life. I want everybody to have a happy life, John. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Dr. Carr, this is absolutely um, uh, has been absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, all of all of Dr. Carr's information is going to be below this video and links to to her website, etc. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. I'm a trauma informed developmental psychologist who helps you find the success strategies that you need now that you didn't get before you were seven. Yeah, simple as that. Simple as that. But very complex at the same time. Yes. There you go. <laughs> well, I love it. Listen, this has been fantastic. Like I said, I would really encourage you to check it out. I mean, I know from some of the stuff that I've done and experienced myself or whatever, uh, you know, when we often make that joke, you know, you know, tell it, you know, the therapist, tell us about your relationship with your parents or whatever, <laughs> but as a joke, but the reality is there is, if you don't, if you don't recognize the stuff from childhood, you know, you're, you're missing out on learning a lot, even if, it, even if you look back and think, yeah, I had a fantastic child, but there's some lessons to be learned there somewhere. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, John Golden says, Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.